focus on AML. Uh, we'll focus on AML and ALL as well as myelodysplastic syndrome. Um, happy National Day for all uh, Saudi and Allah yidim alayna al amin wal aman ya rabbil alameen. Uh, I'm very honored and glad uh, to be part of uh, this because we have four outstanding speakers and the friends and the colleagues in uh, all, uh, um, actually the kingdom. So Medina Munawara, Jeddah, Dammam, and uh, uh, I'm from Riyadh. Uh, yani today is really uh, a nice um, speak. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Ziad Shibani will speak about acute myeloid leukemia. Then Dr. Ahmed Absi will uh, speak about uh, acute lymphoplastic leukemia. Then in the satellite symposium, Dr. Tariq Abu Zaid will talk about optimizing management of acute myeloid leukemia in patients who are not eligible for intensive chemotherapy. Last but not the least, Dr. Mohammed al makadi will give us an update about the myelodysplastic syndrome. So uh, for no further delay, we'll start with our first speaker today is Dr. Ziad Ashibani. Dr. Ziad Ashibani currently is a consultant uh, physician in uh, uh, King Fahad uh, Specialist uh, Hospital Dammam. He finished his uh, fellowship uh, in Princess Margaret uh, uh, Hospital in Toronto. He did uh, allogenic stem cell transplant uh, and le leukemia lymphoma. And actually, he did also a master in teaching uh, in the University of Toronto. Um, he's assistant professor in the University of Toronto. Today, Dr. Ziad Shibani will speak about acute myeloid leukemia update. Please go ahead, Dr. Ziad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salatu salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Thank you, uh, Dr. Marwan, for the kind introduction. And thank you, Dr. Uh, Amal Bayhani, Dr. Talas al Fareh, for inviting me um, uh, today to give uh, and give me this opportunity. Uh, and thank you for uh, AFB for sponsoring. Uh, today, uh, I will be uh, talking about best of ASCO and EHA 2021. And uh, I choose the four uh, abstracts. And I will start with a little uh, introduction. Um, in the beginning, uh, I would like to take this uh, uh, opportunity to send uh, a greetings from heart to uh, uh, our uh, uh, brothers and colleagues in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, government and people on the occasion of Saudi National Day. May God protect the country of the two holy mosques from all uh, evil. Happy uh, National Day, my colleague. My uh, agenda for today, uh, I will be talking about introduction, then uh, for uh, abstract uh, from ASCO and uh, IHA. As uh, all uh, we know, uh, acute myeloid leukemia is a heterogeneous disease. Uh, associated with virus mutations from uh, Britain uh, uh, registry between 2015 till 2017, 30% um, uh, of all leukemia uh, are uh, acute myeloid leukemia. 25% of patients with uh, AML are estimated to be refractory to uh, treatment. And more than 50% of patients with AML estimated to get uh, a relapse. The standard treatment for uh, acute myeloid uh, leukemia, still intensive chemotherapy with seven days uh, RSC and three days of anthracycline. Although this treatment has been in existing uh, since 1973, and a lot of people get into remission with this, unfortunately, uh, the vast uh, majority of patients still relapse, uh, particularly in, in those uh, in old age group. Uh, until now, the currently only standard post remission therapy is uh, hematopoietic stem cell uh, transplant. 
the goal of maintenance uh, post induction uh, therapy uh, is still uh, obvious to try to leave some form of non-toxic therapy doesn't affect quality of life and prolonged overall survival with goal of trying to reduce uh, relapse. So since 1973, um, we can say AML was in the dark and new, no uh, new uh, targeting therapy, but since 2017, uh, over the last four or five years, uh, we can say AML back into the limelight. In this uh, fishbone, we can see uh, the major advance in acute myeloid leukemia over the past five decades from three plus seven. And then in 1990, we get the intensive consolidation high DAC. Um, gemtuzumab uh, get approved for the first time in 2000. And unfortunately, it get withdrawn from the market a few years later due to uh, being no close of uh, disease and get re-approved again uh, in uh, 2017. In the last four years, we get eight drugs to the market and each one is uh, kind of uh, targeting or liposomal or FLET3 inhibitors. This is now how our approach to the, with newly diagnosed acute myeloid leukemia and we can divide the patient to two group or two cohort, the one eligible and uh, the one is in, in, like not eligible for intensive chemotherapy. And this is basically on the uh, physician assessment when you see your patient, for, your patient for the first time, if there is any comorbidity, cardiac, respiratory, respiratory, performance status is not good. So I will be focusing today mainly on those who is eligible for intensive chemotherapy and uh, based on uh, our initial approach, of, like the flow cytometry, uh, um, immunohistochemistry, uh, molecular, and uh, it is a li little bit challenge from center to center. Like for example, we should go get uh, the result of the flow within 24 hours and uh, cytogenetics within 48 hours in the best scenario, and then you get at least uh, the initial uh, uh, molecular marker like uh, FLEC3, IDH1 or 2 uh, within uh, 72 hours. In some center, this is, could be challenged. It is not available. It is sent out. And uh, we will see in, in my abstract, the one I choose, uh, sometimes they have to start this uh, targeted therapy at day eight and some at day one. So uh, core, bind, core binding factors initial to get the result. If you want to add, for example, uh, gemtuzumab, anti-CD33, uh, you need to get what is the status of the FLET3. If it is positive, you can add mydostron, who is approved now. And there is a new medication like gelteritinib uh, we can use. Uh, if you uh, get uh, um, IDH1 or 2, there is targeting medication for that. And for therapy-related AML or acute myeloid leukemia with uh, myelopsiblastic-related change, there is medication get approved in 2017 by FDA and the European Medical Association, which is the CPX, uh, uh, CPX351, which is liposomal uh, donorobustin. So how safe is to wait till we get the result of the molecular and cytogenetics. It is not the scope of today's talk, but this is, uh, there is a good uh, ash. Uh, it was a poster in 2019, and it addressed that point, is it safe to wait for genomic information prior to start uh, your treatment for acute myeloid leukemia? And it was from German registry based on 2,200 patients. So, here we can see all this medication that get approved between 2017 April until now. The only thing missing in this uh, fishbone is September 2020, which is the approval of uh, 
oral is a cytidine as maintenance uh, in acute myeloid leukemia. But we can see like, for example, uh, IDH1 inhibitor, uh, ibocidinib, it get approved in the beginning in 2018 for uh, refractory and relapse acute myeloid leukemia. Later on in May 2019, same medication get approved for newly diagnosed acute myeloid leukemia patient ineligible for intensive chemotherapy. With this medication, new drugs creating a new challenge in acute myeloid leukemia. Now you have a lot of options, uh, a lot of medication that can be added to the uh, backbone of acute myeloid leukemia. And I think soon we will be moving to uh, double and triplet chemotherapy, like what we are doing, for example, in, in, in multiple myeloma. With this, I will go to the first uh, poster, which presented uh, from MD Anderson Group in ASCO 2021. And uh, the first one is um, uh, they try to see uh, IDH1, uh, uh, ibocidinib, and binitoclast with or without cytidine uh, in IDH1 mutation uh, myeloid malignancy. As we know, mutation in isocitrate dehydrogenase, one gene, result in myeloid differentiation arrest and accumulate of uh, the oncometabolites to hydroxyglucuronate uh, promoting leukogenesis. Uh, based on this, I think we have uh, seen two important approval in the last four years with approval of IDH1 in 2018 and IDH2 in August 2017 for relapsed refractory acute myeloid leukemia, as I mentioned, and then uh, as a first line in newly diagnosed not eligible for intensive chemotherapy. Um, IDH uh, mutation, it is about... Um, 10 to 20 percent uh, of acute myeloid uh, leukemia. Uh, this agent is oral agent, well tolerated, and uh, will give the patient uh, good quality of life. In terms of toxicity, um, the major or the main side effect is uh, differentiation uh, syndrome. So uh, the main trial object uh, is to determine the safety and tolerability or efficacy in patients with newly diagnosed and relapsed refractory AML. Um, this uh, combination was uh, on rationale uh, based on a preclinical uh, data that demonstrate IDH1 mutated malignancy have uh, increased dependency on anti-apoptotic uh, uh, protein BCL2 for which uh, Benitoclax uh, is an antagonist. Uh, so there, were, there was a synergistic uh, effect. Wh whether or not uh, this uh, will uh, translate uh, into increased clinical efficacy and it is safe has to be determined. So uh, this is uh, phase one to B. And again, the primary objective is the safety to reliability and uh, uh, to determine the, the, the level of the, uh, of the drug uh, safety. Um, so they are including uh, three cohorts. Uh, the fourth cohort, the data was not ready when, uh, when they present this uh, uh, oral presentation. So the first cohort was IDH1 plus Benitoclax for 100 milligram. And uh, level two is uh, uh, IDH1 with uh, Benetoclax 800. And the reason they increased the dose in, the, in this cohort, uh, because it showed that IDH1, it can increase the metabolism of uh, Benetoclax, so they increase the dose. In the third cohort, they add uh, azacitidine 75 milligram per meter square sub-Q or IV. The total number was 25 patients and uh, the NCTD for seven days, uh, day one to day seven. 
and uh, Benetoclax for uh, 14 days each uh, 28 days cycle. The most uh, common uh, side effect was fever, infection, complication. And when you combined IDH inhibitors and Benetoclax, uh, there is adverse event uh, of a specific interest, which is the IDH differentiation syndrome. It's happening in four patients and tumor lysis syndrome, both of both they treated successfully with clinical management. And uh, regarding the mortality, uh, there was one death reported due to pneumonia uh, above day uh, 60. If we go to the patient uh, characteristics, um, we can see um, the median age group is uh, 67 to 69. Um, the newly diagnosed, uh, which is de novo or therapy related uh, acute myeloid leukemia was more in the cohort three and uh, more uh, relapsed refractory acute myeloid leukemia uh, in cohort uh, one. Um, and uh, MDS MPM1, there is two patients in cohort three. Um, regarding the cytogenetics molecular, the ALN risk group, we can see more of um, adverse uh, and intermediate uh, in cohort three and in cohort uh, one. Um, most of the patients received prior line of treatment uh, from um, like from zero to four, um, but uh, these were mainly on uh, cohort one. So as we, we can see, the, uh, there is a heterogeneous patient population mix of MDS, MPN, a newly diagnosed, relapsed refractory, more relapsed refractory in those level one and, and those level two. So this data has to uh, interpret in this uh, context. Uh, it is small number of, uh, of patients and still it is phase one B. So it's hard to draw any conclusion from this, but uh, regarding efficacy, we can see all the patient in cohort one, they achieve a composite CR. In cohort number three, 85% uh, achieved uh, composite CR, uh, and two achieved uh, morphological leukemia free state and one partial remission. In cohort number two, there was two non remission, and 67% uh, they achieved uh, the composite uh, CR. And median follow up was uh, uh, 17 months. Uh, the 12 uh, months uh, overall survival was 83% with a combination of uh, IDH1 inhibitor, venetoclax 400 milligram, and azacitidine. In subgroup uh, analysis, if we divide it by, uh, by disease, if we look, for example, to MDS, MBM1, 100% the 12 months overall survival, and 50% uh, and acute myeloid uh, uh, leukemia. And uh, um, the conclusion from the group also showed that uh, IDH1 and venetoclax plus minus cytidine improved survival for patients with acute myeloid leukemia and MRD negative versus MRD uh, positive. As, as we already know, if your patient uh, MRD negative, uh, their chance for uh, remission and survival is much better. So um, in conclusion, com combination of ibocidinib plus benetoclax with or without L-cytidine has tolerate and expected safety profile. Interim results suggest high composite complete remission rate, both with and without ASA. MRD negative composite complete remission seen in newly diagnosed and refractory relapse acute myeloid leukemia. Durable preliminary response were seen across the disease group. Still enrollment ongoing for uh, additional triple cohort at higher uh, venetoplax uh, dose. The second poster, it was uh, from Iha and from uh, Dr. Doher and his group. 
uh, and uh, it is about uh, Quizar uh, AML001. We heard about Quizar since 2019, and uh, to take a step back to uh, 2020 uh, ASCO, uh, there, wa there was an, um, a presentation by Dr. Wee uh, from Australia and his group. But for me, in, in EHA uh, 2021, the one that stood out for me at EHA was the benefit of ASA maintenance in MPM1 positive patients. The number were unbelievable. Um, so this is uh, from New England. This is the original uh, um, uh, CC486 uh, drugs. And uh, it, it was 470 patients, uh, more than 55 years of age with acute myeloid leukemia in first remission after chemotherapy. Uh, the median overall survival was 24 months compared to 14 months in the placebo group with significant B-value. Median relapsed free survival was 10 months compared to 4.8 months in placebo group. Uh, the issue with, with, with this uh, paper was uh, uh, it doesn't uh, explain or uh, elucidate uh, which subgroup of patients may get great benefit from oral ASA based on prognostic feature or mutation, uh, mutational profiles. So Dr. Doher in EHA, uh, and uh, he uh, focused uh, or he analyzed uh, evaluate survival outcome by uh, MPM1 and the FLET3 uh, mutation. Uh, in ASCO, there was a presentation also, and uh, it, it showed that uh, oral cytidine reduced mortality risk by 30% and risk of uh, relapse by 40% uh, percent in patients with AML in remission following intensive uh, chemotherapy. Um, so the aim of uh, we can the aim of uh, investigate uh, it is uh, the relationship between oral ASA and survival in post hoc analysis based on cytogenetic uh, risk classification uh, AML subtype de novo or secondary and uh, MPM1 flic uh, three status at diagnosis. Uh, so. Um, the, the performance status was uh, less or equal to three, and uh, they include the poor risk genetics and intermediate risk. Uh, there was like uh, um, two cohort placebo and oral ASA, 300 milligram daily um, for uh, two weeks, uh, and the uh, like. The dividing it had must be having less than four months uh, of the uh, CR uh, or CRI documentation, and the response assessment every three cycles. And uh, if patient is still in remission, they continue treatment. But if uh, there is increase in the blast count, uh, optional either to treatment escalation or uh, to, uh, to to stop the study. But if it's the blast count more than fifteen percent. Uh, to discontinue uh, treatment. Two minutes, Dr. Zia. Sorry? Uh, two minutes, or you can give so, you up. You in, can give in, up to five minutes if needed. So in Kuzar study, if we look to the uh, MPM1, um, uh, the, the, the cohort who received oral azacitidine, it showed 47% uh, uh, overall survival compared to 19% uh, on the wild type. And uh, the relapse-free uh, survival was 23 uh, compared to the uh, people who didn't uh, receive. So there is a, a great uh, benefit and uh, significant B-value. If we look to the people in the FLET3, so in the FLET3 group, uh, the median overall survival was 28 compared to 9%. Though B-value was not significant, I think because of the small number, but we can see in the uh, relapse uh, free event, uh, there was also benefit in the FLIT3 mutated. So uh, in the third uh, poster was regarding 
the uh, liposomal uh, downerobicin. And uh, we know it is uh, get approved in 2017. And uh, the, the goal of, the, um, of, um, uh, of liposomal or, uh, or this study it is a first phase treatment trial with target agents. And uh, also the primary endpoint is just the safety. Um, and here we have to give the cytogenetics and molecular, uh, the include patient age 18 to 75. So you can include younger patient or older patient, uh, equage performance zero to two, um, and the enrolled patient to three, three cohorts. The first one with, BC, uh, with uh, BCL2 positive, second cohort with a FLIT3, and they give them a minosterone, and the third cohort with IDH2. So you cannot enroll the patient if you don't get this, uh, the result of this mutation early. And the secondary endpoint is the response and uh, uh, CR or CRI. Uh, this is the baseline characteristics, uh, total number uh, around 26 patients, uh, median age group uh, where 54 and uh, 40, uh, this is the, uh, the poor risk cytogenetics. They are more common with venetoclax and uh, liposomal group. And uh, in, in, in this group also, there is a lot of patients with B53. We know they are difficult to treat and they are high risk for relapse. So in uh, um, regarding the safety, there was 13 uh, serious events were reported across the treatment, febrile neutropenia uh, and sepsis. Um, and uh, there is eight patients died uh, in all, uh, like uh, during the study. Um, but we can see uh, the, the CR rate uh, in, in, in the second cohort with mitosterone was 100% compared to venetoclax CBX. But as we mentioned, the most sick patients were in this, in this cohort. So in conclusion, was phase 1b uh, trials, and they tried to uh, combine CBX plus venetoclax or, or medistorone uh, in, uh, to, to see the safety of the profile. Without any delay, in one minute or less, uh, the third uh, poster was about uh, um, efficacy and safety of venetoclax in combination with keltretinib uh, phase three trials. It is presented by Dr. Altman. And as we know, Dr. Altman and Dr. Mabel Dever uh, from MD Anderson and from Chicago University, they are working on this for the last uh, three or four years. And uh, the background was coming from phase three admiral uh, trial. Uh, as we know, in admiral uh, trial, uh, keltretinib showed uh, improving overall survival uh, nine months compared to five months in the placebo group. And uh, on that trial, the admiral trial, because it takes long time to recruit, only 12% receive FLIT3 uh, inhibitor. So this is the study design, relapsed refractory acute myeloid leukemia, and WBC count is 1025. They are two cohorts to, uh, to, to decide which drug uh, level is safe, 400. Uh, venetoclax with 80 galtretinib and then 120 uh, milligram of galtretinib and 400. And if the patient they will go to expansion dose just for just for FLIT3 positive, which they will receive 120 milligram of galtretinib with uh, uh, venetoclax. Uh, most of these patients, 62, they receive prior FLIT3. And uh, regarding the prior line of treatment, some of them receive up to five lines. And uh, there is few patients receive uh, prior stem cell uh, transplant. Um, this is regarding the safety profile. 30-day uh, mortality was zero, but uh, there is six patients uh, died within 60 days um, and one uh, developed tumor lice syndrome. So this is the summary of the best uh, response. And we can see uh, the modified uh, composite CR rate was 76% uh, uh, with galtretinib and uh, uh, compared to 54% uh, uh, on the uh, admiral uh, trial. So um, without any delay, I will conclude here. And uh, this is a promising data showed that 
a combination of benetoclacs and galtritinib uh, demonstrate deep reduction in the FLIT3 uh, ITD allelic burden in patient achieving modified composite uh, CR. Uh, so uh, benetoclacs in combination with galtritinib was well tolerated and demonstrate a blast clearance in 90% of patients with FLIT3 mutated AML. Still, it is phase 1B. Uh, the num we need more number and we need uh, a phase uh, 3. With this, I will conclude and uh, thank you uh, so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ziad, uh, for uh, your uh, review. And uh, we will uh, delay the question to the uh, discussion part. Uh, uh, now we'll proceed with the second lecture for today with uh, Dr. Ahmed Al Absi. Dr. Ahmed Al Absi is a head of uh, hematology and uh, bone marrow transplant uh, section in uh, um, Princess uh, Noura uh, Cancer Center in Jeddah uh, under the umbrella of the National Guard uh, Jeddah. Dr. Ahmed Al Absi is um, uh, well known uh, in our uh, um, hematology uh, um, uh, group and uh, he's an excellent speaker i'm sure uh, you, you like uh, his presentation about the acute lymphoplastic leukemia uh, dr ahmed please go ahead hey uh, thank you very much for this invitation i would also like to thank the uh, organizing committee for this um yep i will try to make it really short uh, it probably will be shorter than the, my allocated time so i'm only presenting actually three, three abstracts that i personally think uh, are of um, importance to me uh, so the first one was uh, this abstract uh, presented by the guys at mayo clinic uh, what they looked at is the issues of adult philadelphia like b-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia so as we know that there is this subcategory of uh, what we call Philadelphia-like ALL, the Philadelphia-like ALL, even though uh, they don't harbor the Philadelphia chromosome or the bcr -ABL rearrangement, but they do show by uh, uh, genetic profiling, a gene signature profile that is very similar to Philadelphia subtype. Now, the downside about uh, this group of Philadelphia positive, uh, Philadelphia like ALL, is the fact that their response to tyrosine kinase inhibitors is, uh, is uh, suboptimal, even though uh, a small proportion of patients may still respond to TKI, but the majority don't. And uh, this uh, made their prognosis uh, significantly worse than both uh, Philadelphia negative and Philadelphia positive ALL. They, uh, those cases are, uh, the number of those cases increases with age, uh, even though they are pretty rare in uh, pediatric patients, but they gradually increase with age, uh, constituting around 20 to 40%, uh, depending on the patient population you are uh, studying. So what those guys uh, did is that uh, uh, they wanted to look at uh, the uh, uh, outcomes of uh, allogeneic uh, bone marrow transplantation, as well as standard therapy compared to both uh, Philadelphia positive and Philadelphia negative ALL. So uh, what they did is that they went to the um, uh, cytogenetics uh, bank of Mayo Clinic for ALL positive cases. And uh, they applied the uh, FISH panel developed locally uh, with probes uh, for Philadelphia-like specific rearrangements, which include, uh, as we all know, the ABL1, ABL2, platelet-derived uh, growth factor, beta, JAK2, and CRLF2. Um, and out of their total group, they identified around 10% of the patients with a signature by fish that is what we call Philadelphia-like. Uh, they uh, were, compared to the whole group cohort, uh, they were uh, more uh, likely to be younger with a median age of around 40. 
compared to 50 with Philadelphia positive ALL and 49 with Philadelphia negative ALL. They also tended to have higher WBC count on presentation. This is the uh, patient uh, characteristics as well as the outcomes. So you look here, you have around 10% uh, of the population that is Philadelphia-like ALL, uh, with uh, around 130 cases with Philadelphia positive ALL and 188 cases with Philadelphia negative ALL. The CR rate uh, was uh, uh, the lowest with the Philadelphia-like ALL, and that was statistically significant. MRD at either end of induction or consolidation or any patient achieving MRD, although this data was only available for half of the cohort. Uh, so MRD negativity, what it was achieved in, uh, in, uh, uh, in 37% uh, or on other hands, MRD positive patients, if you want, are 64% of the patient population. 34 with Philadelphia positive and 35 with Philadelphia negative. So the two thirds of patients with Philadelphia like ALL were actually MRD positive during their therapy, regardless at which juncture. Overall survival for the whole patient population um, was also uh, uh, inferior for the Philadelphia like ALL, even though it didn't differ much in the first year of therapy but it dropped gradually over the years. Uh, by, by five years, the Philadelphia-like ALL, the overall survival was only 40%. Whereas we see that the Philadelphia-positive ALL had the best survival reported at 64% at five years, which actually goes uh, with the theme of multiple other studies showing that Philadelphia-positive gradually actually picking up um, uh, prognosis uh, to be as good as, if not even better than the case of Philadelphia negative. Uh, we saw, we see that the majority of this inferior outcome in Philadelphia like is due to relapses because the relapse rate at uh, five years is around 40%. So uh, this is uh, their conclusion that Philadelphia positive ALL is a very high risk group of patients with increased prevalence in younger age. Uh, um, and they uh, concluded as well that uh, uh, in those patients who underwent allogeneic bone marrow transplantation from the whole group, that their uh, prognosis actually picks up uh, to be almost equivalent uh, to the patients who are Philadelphia uh, positive or Philadelphia negative. Um, so, you know, I know that many of us are actually not applying this FISH panel to detect those cases, but uh, unfortunately, if we don't, many of those patients who of us are already treating them, uh, you know, the median age here was 39. So some of us would still consider them standard risk patients because they don't harbor any of the high risk group. And uh, the only unanswered questions in, is in this population would be the benefit of MRD and whether or not the MRD would still uh, would, would, would hold uh, its grounds as a predictive of good outcome, regardless of allogeneic bone marrow transplantation performance or not. The other uh, abstract that I will be presenting is the issue of um, enotuzumab. Uh, and this is a real life uh, data of using enotuzumab free transplant as salvage therapy for relapsed uh, refractory patients and looking at the risk of venoocclusive disease. As we all know, inotuzumab is already approved since 2017 as a therapy for relapsed refractory ALL, a salvage therapy. And uh, one of the concerns with inotuzumab is that associated with hepatotoxicity and venoocclusive disease. Uh, and that's why the recommendations right now is to space uh, the last dose of vino, uh, with inotuzumab at transplant and to use uh, a single alkylator preferative regimen 
uh, as well as uh, probably uh, utilize uh, prophylaxis for BOD in those patients. So in this uh, trial, they looked at uh, registry data from the CIBMTR uh, for all the patients who used uh, enotuzumab. They obviously looked only at uh, adult patients and uh, uh, they reported the outcomes, including the side effects. So uh, there were a total of 130 patients in the data set that have used enotuzumab prior to allogeneic stem cell transplantation. And uh, the outcomes uh, were as uh, follows. In that group, 31% uh, of them underwent allogeneic stem cell transplantation in CR1, 46% in CR2, and 13% in CR3. 70% had transplant from peripheral blood stem cell, and 47% were either HLA identical sibling or other related donor and uh, half of them were myelo uh, ablative. So out of this uh, group, 36% received the ENO uh, one cycle before the ALO. Uh, half of them received two cycles and 17% received three or more. And uh, half of them received ENO as single agent with the other half using it in combination with other chemotherapy. Median time from the last dose of ENO to hematopoietic stem cell transplant was actually uh, two uh, months. This is the uh, data, the outcome. So veno occlusive disease reported within 100 days post hematopoietic stem cell transplant was reported in 13%. And uh, uh, post uh, uh, Hematopoietic stem cell transplantation continued CR rate was 89% with an overall survival rate of uh, uh, 55%. The hematopoietic stem cell transplant related mortality was 21% with post relapse 12 months mortality of 25%. And the post hematopoietic stem cell transplant re uh, relapse at 12 months was 36%. This data is actually pretty important, uh, although, as we know, in the uh, INNOVATE uh, trial, um, some of those patients underwent hematopoietic stem cell transplant, but we never had it actually. Uh, um, what we lacked is the real uh, uh, live uh, data to look into these issues. So we clearly, clearly right now uh, would know uh, what's the risk and uh, how to plan appropriately for our transplant. And uh, as such, calculate the risk benefit ratios in those patient population. So um, in conclusion, in this study, incidence of VOD SOS after first hematopoietic stem cell transplant in the ENO treated patients with relapsed refractory ALL was similar to the 18, 19% reported in the pooled, uh, pooled analysis of two clinical trials. The larger would be the Innovate among inotreated patients. And the non-relapse mortality at one year of 21% uh, is lower than the non-relapse mortality of, of one year of 38% reported in the pooled analysis of the relapse refractory ALL in the Eno recipient. Um, finally, that's uh, of actually also major importance to me, this trial, which is the uh, value of MRD at end of induction and consolidation. Now, as we all know, minimal residual disease detection, either by flow cytometry or by molecular testing, uh, does carry a great importance. This was mostly validated in pediatric uh, setting more than uh, its validation in adult setting. One thing that we were lacking before is uh, clear data showing uh, the uh, benefit of uh, uh, number one, uh, intensification of therapy and consolidation in relation to MRD positivity at end of induction. Uh, we at our center currently depend on two uh, data points to detect MRD. One is at end of induction and the other is at end of consolidation. And we take the decision of allogeneic bone marrow transplantation based on the MRD at end of consolidation. 
We do introduce an intensification for MRD positive patient at the end of at the end of consolidation in the form of blinatumumab to clear the MRD positivity. But we are basing this data based on experiences from the pediatric realm. And we never actually had uh, a very solid evidence to base our practice on. So what this group did is that they took uh, the ALL13311 uh, study from the pediatrics and they picked up from that, well, this study was actually mostly intended for high-risk uh, pediatric patients, which they defined uh, as either older age, which is age 30 to 13, whom uh, all of us in adult uh, in Saudi Arabia treat, or uh, any of age group plus one of the high risk features that includes KMT2A rearrangement, which we don't check for, and I don't think anyone in Saudi Arabia currently checking for, or uh, amplification uh, 21, uh, our hypodiploidy, uh, pure hypodiploidy of less than 44 chromosomes, or any CNS positive patient. So at end of induction, minimal residual disease defined positivity as more than 0.01. As we know from the previous data from all COG trials, that the predicted four-year free disease-free survival was approximately 70%. The question was whether patients with very high risk B cell ALL who are MRD positive at end of induction and become MRD negative at end of consolidation will have improved survival versus patients remaining MRD positive at end of consolidation is unknown. So again, this trial was subset analysis of the ALL1131. So patients with the newly diagnosed National Cancer Institute high-risk BALL enrolled on the ALL1131 classified as very high risk at end of induction were treated on the very high risk stratum of the AALL1131 using fractionated cyclophosphamide, etoposide, and clofarabine. The investigational arm was uh, compared to the standard of care consolidation. MRD was measured by six color flow cytometry at end of induction, and those who consented for end of consolidation. The results, four-year disease-free survival for all patients with very high risk BALL was 76.8 plus minus 2%. Four-year disease-free survival was not significantly different between the uh, control arm, the standard arm, and the experimental arm, 85.5 plus minus 6.8% versus 72.3 plus minus 6.3%. The four year, so the, uh, this study was actually already published, by the way, and it's a negative study. So intensification with the fractionated cyclophosphamide, clofarabine, etoposide didn't add any benefit. That's not the part that we are interested in. The part we are interested in is uh, this part. The four year disease free survival for patients who were end of induction MRD negative versus positive was 83.3% versus 72.0%. And to complete the story, we look here at the control arm, which we are interested in. The experimental arm was inferior, so we don't uh, look at it. The control arm, the patients with end of consolidation who became MRD negative, and they were positive at end of induction, had an overall survival, disease-free survival of 77.6%, meaning that those patients who are able to attain MRD negativity at end of consolidation, they will have an outcome that is almost similar to patients who are MRD negative at end of induction. Almost similar, and I say almost because they're, they're, the, the numbers with Patients with end of induction MRD negativity, their disease free survival was 83.3%. Now look at the end of consolidation MRD positive patients, their disease free survival is only 55%, which is significantly inferior. And this is a very high group risk group of patients that need special attention. Now, even though what I'm saying here may seem to be very, uh, I would say, logic, but we really lack the evidence for it. 
And the reason I say that, uh, so this is the conclusions, MRD is a powerful prognostic indicator for very high risk B cell ALL with inferior outcomes in patients who are end of induction MRD positive. Among patients who were end of induction MRD positive treated on experimental arm outcomes were similar to end of induction consolidation MRD negative and end of induction consolidation MRD positive. In contrast, patients who were end of induction MRD positive treated on the control arm that were end of consolidation MRD negative had significantly improved disease-free survival compared to those who were end of induction MRD positive. The control arm remains the standard of care of COG ALL trials. With this therapy, patients with very high risk BLALL that are end of induction MRD positive and end of consolidation MRD negative had significantly improved disease-free survival compared to those that remain MRD positive at end of consolidation. This is what we do in our center, which is pretty much similar. Uh, we do standards uh, for drug induction, and we do uh, end of in induction evaluation, including MRD. Now, the MRD at end of induction, we use it only to uh, decide when and how intense are we going with our consolidation, but the consolidation components itself is standard. We proceed with consolidation and we repeat the MRD at the end of consolidation. And based on this, we classify the patients to be a very high risk group or a standard risk to continue with chemo alone. We do incorporate blinatumumab at that juncture for patients who are MRD uh, positive. Uh, at end of consolidation. Although now I'm doubting or even seriously entertaining that uh, including linatumumab for all patients who are MRD positive at end of induction, uh, not only at end of consolidation. Um, and uh, otherwise the patients will continue on their uh, journey which is uh, standard interim maintenance, high dose MTX, delayed intensification, CAPESI maintenance, and their maintenance. So I would stop here, and that's my the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Mawar. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed Absi, for uh, this uh, three uh, nice abstract. Uh, it's very important, really, to choose uh, the uh, abstract that may change the practice. And this is a difficult job because you are um, uh, researching on uh, many, many very uh, excellent uh, abstract. Uh, please, uh, I want to announce to please uh, write your question uh, in the Q&A uh, uh, part, and uh, we will answer all your questions. Um, and uh, this um, session is uh, recorded, and um, today uh, webinar is sponsored by AbV, so we need to thank the sponsors. Um, so uh, we will open now the floor for uh, questions, uh, and this uh, question will cover the first two uh, um, lect uh, lectures. So here, um, there is one question from our colleague in the MAM, Dr. Mohamed Darwish. Um, his question is, out of this trial uh, studies, what is the chemotherapy protocol used in Saudi Arabia? Uh, nowadays for induction consolidation and maintenance for uh, AML. So uh, this question is to Dr. Ziad uh, Shibani. So what you use in the MAM, Dr. Uh, Ziad? Uh... Uh, Dr. Marwan, um, so far we are still using uh, seven plus uh, three. Uh, as uh, induction uh, chemotherapy for all patients with acute myeloid leukemia. Um, we don't use like IDA, um, only on salvage or MIC. And the reason I think when I mentioned in my presentation, uh, we don't get the result of uh, pathogenetics and molecular in uh, timely fashion. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the challenge. So still we are using three plus seven uh, for uh, anyone fit for induction. And uh, we, we use the L-cytidine and venetoclax uh, for unfit patient. No, so for fit patient, Dr. Ziad, what, uh, what's your consolidation? You, you, you give the high dose or the intermediate dose? Uh, the high dose, the, the high dose uh, RSC. RSC high uh, dose. Three, uh, up to uh, gram per meter square. 
And for maintenance for AML, are you using, uh, for example, in FLIT3, any maintenance? For FLIT3, the, the one we are using in, in the MAM is uh, Sorifinib, and uh, it is due to logistic re uh, reason, and uh, they are not using Medistrone. It was approved by the, the local uh, committee that Sorifinib was available, so they are using Sorifinib in the MAM, not, not Medistrone. And uh, even after transplant for maintenance, yes, they are using FLIT3 maintenance. Okay, uh, question to Dr. Ralapsi. Uh, question is, is there any new study for TALL failing induction with the BFM or hyper-CVAD? Yeah, not necessarily in this, uh, this meeting. I mean, there were some uh, phase one, phase two trials uh, that, uh, that actually just built on what we know before regarding the venetoclax and other newer BCL inhibitors. Um, but it seems that uh, that patient population will benefit uh, in the future of the BCL2 inhibitors. I mean, we know that theme before, and I think uh, all the question right now is how to best use them in combination with other agents. That's the unanswered part. Uh, but uh, certainly, yes, uh, um, again, none of those are approved therapies, but uh, yeah, I think uh, this is where the, what the future holds for those patient population, which is BCL2 inhibitors. There are multiple abstracts, but all of them in, in phase one, phase two formats. And also, Dr. Absey, for uh, the VOD, in the study, there was uh, a prophylaxis uh, in those patient they didn't mention, they didn't mention, to be honest, and uh, the issue of the prophylaxis, I think it uh, sh sh should be based on patient to patient, yani, as you know, the other factors also play a role, uh, whether or not uh, the uh, patient, the donor is a mesh sibling donor or not, it's, uh, or, or what's the preparative regimen being used. We currently, we don't actually, I mean, we do use only orthodoxy uh, or so, for those patients, um, but uh, uh, but uh, yeah, we, we have not been using defibrotide uh, for all patients post inotuzumab. Uh, we only use it if uh, the patient is deemed to be really high risk. We do space them, uh, give at least a month, preferably two months uh, from the last dose of eno to transplant. And I know this is challenging because you don't want to keep the patients without any therapy. What we did also in some patients is to bridge with benetumumab, especially if the patient is still MRD positive at uh, post eno salvage. Uh, what's your favorite uh, ALL induction uh, regimen? Here a question by Dr. Uh, Abdel Fattah Al Khair. He said, um, induction treatment, would you prefer hyper CVAD like or BFM like regimen? I know maybe this um, question is. Uh, take maybe a de more detail, but the, in short, uh, in, your, in your hospital, you are using now the BFM-like, yeah? Yeah, we do BFM-like for up to age 45. Although, to be honest, in induction, I don't really think it matters. Um, I mean, I honestly would prefer BFM for all patients because it's just uh, lighter than using hyper red especially in induction. You look at the hyper red complications, and it's mostly in, in the first couple of cycles but uh, down the road, it becomes less, you encounter less. On the other hand, when you look at the complications of the BFM is actually more encountered down the road rather than in the induction phase itself. Um, yeah, there is one dose of pig aspargenase and it's given late. So even if you'll see the complications of pig aspargenase and induction, you, you will typically see it in early in consolidation. So in induction, uh, we currently use BFM backbone uh, for all patients up to age 45. That's how that's what, what we do. Uh, we do the same in Riyadh. Uh, um, Dr. Ziad, I have a question uh, regarding the venetoclax duration. The MD Anderson were suggesting to decrease it to 14 days in the first two cycles. Uh, what's your opinion um, for the duration? And you mean Marwan in, in general? Not in, in general, no, yeah, yeah, in general. In, in general, uh, we're still using it uh, for 25 to 28 days. Uh, in our center, we combined we combined it with venetoclax just in order to reduce the cost. Uh, as we know, if you give venetoclax, you can start with 100. Uh, but for the induction, still we will give 25 to 28 days 
with Vitoclax if you want to reduce the dose and uh, give the support with platelets, blood, and uh, prophylaxis. So patient tolerate the full uh, duration in your center, yeah, younger, younger population in our centers. Uh, perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, please write uh, your question and answer, and we will answer it at our next uh, discussion part. Uh, this session is recorded, and uh, now we'll proceed with the um, satellite uh, symposium. Uh, our speaker is Dr. Professor uh, Tariq Abu Zaid. Professor Tariq Abu Zaid uh, is a professor of uh, hematology and uh, allergenic uh, stem cell transplant uh, from Al Mansura. Uh, University in Egypt. Uh, Dr. Uh, Tariq Abu Zaid is also um, um, uh, chairman of uh, medicine department uh, of the Faculty of Medicine in, uh, uh, in um, Al Moussa Hospital in Dammam. And uh, he's uh, having uh, more than 23 years now uh, of experience in hematology. And um, without further delay, Dr. Uh, Prof. Tariq Abu Zaid will talk about optimizing the management for uh, AML patient who, are, who is ineligible uh, for uh, intensive chemotherapy. Uh, Prof. Tariq, please uh, proceed. Uh, uh, thank you, dear uh, colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Marawar, for this uh, nice introduction. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammad. First of all, congratulations for all our colleague and all our uh, uh, persons living on this holy soil, okay, for the National Day of uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. May God bless the country that harboring the two holy mosques. Uh, it gave me the honor and pleasure to attend today's this meeting, and special thanks go for the Saudi Society for Blood Disorder, special Dr. Tras and Dr. Amal, and also for Avi for supporting this meeting. To go Today, we're going to discuss optimizing management for patients with AML ineligible for intensive chemotherapy. My disclaimer, okay. First of all, as we all know, what are the challenges that we are facing in treating newly diagnosed AML? First, assessment of the risk of the patient, defining therapy based on the biological feature and risk, defining therapy based on the clinical features, managing treatment-related adverse events, and managing risk of relapse through maintenance or consolidative strategies. Our problem is AML is an aggressive disease that most commonly seen in elderly patients with poor outcome and limited treatment option. According to the instance of AML five-year surveillance in the States from 2014 to 2018, the median age at diagnosis were discovered to be 68 years old. Okay, it is constantly increasing with the advances in age. It is less than 4.4% in patients in the first two decades to reach maximum between the age of 65 to 74. But all are agree that we have younger age population in the Arabic world than that in, seen in the Western world. The five year survival, okay, in spite of the advances that has been uh, done in the therapy is remaining frustrated low. 28.3%. It is high as 60% for patients younger than 45 due to the percentage of the transplantation eligible patients. But with advances of the age, it is decreasing to 3.4 in patients elderly than 75. Therefore, the overall five year survival remained as low as 28.3%. Uh, the MD Anderson has compared the treatment strategies and the overall survival for patients. Uh, of AML between the era of the 70s and the last decade. If we look for patients younger than 60 years, in the 70s, the over five years overall survival were 13% and shoots to 55% in the last decade, this fourfold increase. Whereas in patients elder than 60, it was 8% and shoots only to 70%, which means only twofold increase. Therefore, in spite of advances in therapy, patient Elder than 60 remain a challenge for us. But who is eligible or ineligible for the intensive chemotherapy? This is a question. Or our younger colleagues are facing the same problem we are facing nowadays. How should we decide? Is this patient fit for intensive chemotherapy or not? Several models exist to define the eligibility, but there is no unique consensus. The most commonly used is either 
the Ferrara criteria or treatment related mortality. The Ferrara criteria generally uh, consider the patient ineligible for intensive chemotherapy if his age is more than 75 years, severe organ comorbidity, active infection uh, resistant to antimicrobial, cognitive dysfunction, and performance status more than or equivalent to three. Whereas the treatment related mortality is the ability to predict death at day 28 of individual receiving intensive chemotherapy. If we look, both the FERA criteria and treatment relating score are matched together in the patient with fit to therapy, but they are not meeting together in unfit patient. And it will maybe hear more better. If we look to the overall survival in FERARA criteria, FERARA fit patient having prolonged overall survival compared to FERARA unfit, whereas overall survival in treatment related mortality, also the lower treatment related mortality having higher and prolonged overall survival compared to higher TRM. If we group them together, we'll see that the prolonged and best overall survival is seen in Ferrara fit, lower TRM, followed by Ferrara fit and higher TRM, and very low seen in Ferrara unfit, higher TRM, and Ferrara unfit, lower TRM, which means that the fitness is matched for, together, but unfit patient, there is discrepancy. This is the problem on which should we rely in Ferrara criteria or treatment-related mortality? It remains the decision of physician. If we look here, what are the challenges we are seeing? Probability to, for treatment-related mortality or probability to induce durable remission? The treatment-related mortality is patient characteristic, age, performance status, and comorbidity. This is the clinical fitness, whereas the induction of uh, durable remission remains of the disease characteristic, cytogenetic, molecular abnormality, and the state of MRD. If we look to the Libra, it's more in the advantage for the biological fitness of the patient. Are we in looking for uh, disease durable remission or not? This is the cytogenetic uh, classification and genetic abnormality as revised by the Ellen criteria 2017. We are proving the patient into favorable, intermediate, and adverse. And as Dr. Ziad said, most of these abnormalities are always appear from the lab very late. Even with the proposed additional gene mutation, whether the use of uh, women's tumor one or BCL6 core repressor protein or a step binding protein, IDH1, or even DNA methyl transferase or ZRSR mutation, these are in order to classify the patient. Are they favorable, intermediate, or adverse? This, if the patient is transplantation eligible or ineligible for intensive chemotherapy. But what is the problem we are facing? Generally speaking, ineligible are elderly because they are clinical and biological heterogeneous, may arise as de nouveau, or in the setting of earlier hematological disease, clinical factors are crucial in decision regarding the management. Therefore, elderly AML represent a challenge for us because of the poor performance status, higher in the subcomorbid disease. Some of them may present with low white blood cell count at the start, make us a difficulty to start the treatment, lower percentage of the maroplast. Some of us may be conceived by this low, lower percentage, higher likelihood of multidrug resistant, higher likelihood to develop uh, unfavorable cytogenetic. And this is also common in elderly. Achieving remission is very low higher likelihood for treatment-related morbidity and mortality, and the survival is an issue. This makes us a challenge for treating elderly patients. But if we look to the California Cancer Registry from 2014 to 2017, they looked for patients elder than 60 years receive different treatment modalities. 42% received non-traditional therapy with a hypomosalitic agent, then plus hypomosalitic agent, or liposomal downeropsin. Traditional cytotoxic drugs, 36%. Most of them receive anthracycline plus citrapin or no treatment. If we look, the percentage of non-traditional survey is increasing. Okay, 85% were using hypomycelity alone because the study was uh, till 2017 and the approval for them or liposomal downloropsin in 2018. But this showed that higher percentage of the patients are now receiving non-traditional survey. If we look to comparison, ASA versus D-cytopin and LDAC, 
Azacitabine as a phase three trial in patient age more than 65 years with more than 30% plus in the marrow, median age was 75. The median overall survival was 10.4 months compared to 6.5 months with the patient with conventional care regimen. In this Azacitabine phase three trial, patient age or equal to 65 years with 20% plus, median age was 73. The median overall survival 7.7 .7 months compared to five months in the treatment care. LEDAC, also the same, having median overall survival 3.1 months compared to hydroxyurea. For our younger generation, LEDAC and hydroxyurea 20 years ago was the only available medication for elderly people. If we look, highest percentage or highest median overall survival have been seen in patients receiving ASA. With the emerging of newer agent and targeted therapy, like the FLET3 inhibitor, the IDH1 or IDH2 inhibitor approved only in the States, or the GLAS-DGIP approved in the States and in the case A since two years, or PCL2 inhibitor. All are adding value for the treatment. But if you look, in 2018, two molecules has been added in the therapy. The small molecule inhibitor, GLAS-DGIP, which is a hedgehog inhibitor, and the BCL2 inhibitor, you need to class. If we look to the hedgehog inhibitor pathway, hedgehog inhibitor is responsible for leukemic plus proliferation, apoptosis, and stem cell renewal. If we inhibit this pathway, we are inhibiting the leukemic plus proliferation, induction of apoptosis, and prevent the stem cell and, and, and stimulate stem cell cell renewal. According to the Bright ML study, which is a one double O three. It is a phase two open uh, uh, labeled study comparing glass LEDAC versus LEDAC alone. Here is the inclusion criteria with first line AML or higher MDS patient aged more than seventy five years or more than fifty five years with comorbidity. They group the patient. One arm received glass made one hundred milligram plus LEDAC versus LEDAC twenty milligram DID for ten days. If we look for the complete remission rate, it was higher in the combination of glas plus LEDAC versus LEDAC alone. For all patients, CR rate has been seen in 19.2% compared to 2.6%. In de novo AML, it is 18.4% versus 5.6%. For secondary AML, it, is, it was 20% versus zero. No one of secondary AML achieved CR with LEDAC. According to the cytogenetic, good to intermediate cytogenetic, 22.4% compared to 0%, whereas poor cytogenetic, 13.8% and 5.9%. What is also important, median duration of the remission, uh, of the complete remission in days, glass plus LEDAC, 300 and point day, which almost 10 months, whereas LEDAC alone, 91 days, which almost three months. We are talking about 10 months median CR rate compared to three months. If we look to the median overall survival, it was advanced and better in the glass LEDAC uh, combination, 8.3 months compared to LEDAC alone, 4.3 months. These results are highly suggestive that this combination in patient elderly than 75 or patient with severe comorbidity is a promising for all of us. Also, targeting PCL2 and ML. It has been uh, shown that PCL2 is highly expressed in some of ML patients, and patient expressing PCL2 has higher uh, resistance to chemotherapy with both survival. It goes back this phase two trial to 2012 by Cantarjan and has been also uh, reinforced by Dinardo in blood 2019, combining denitoclax to hypomyelitic agent and to co compare it with hypomyelitic agent alone. As alone, the, uh, the composite CR rate was 27.8%, and this item is 17.8%. When combining the hypomyelitic agent with venetoclax, it shoots to 67%. Median overall survival in months, in ASA, it is 10.4 months. In this item, 7.7, when combining to venetoclax, it shoots to 17.5. Overall response rate in percentage after one year of therapy in azacitabine, it is 46.5%, not rich in this cytabine. 
In venetoclax, after one year, it is almost 60%, and after two years, 46%. It is similar after two years after, like that as a, a seen in one year. Therefore, in favor combining venetoclax to hypomusalating agent for infection. This goes to the Vialli A. It is a phase three double blind study combining Ben plus ESA versus placebo ESA. Key inclusion criteria here for our juniors, elderly patient more than 75 years and patient more than 18 years with comorbidity rendering them ineligible for intensive chemo survey. And this is the importance. Either the patient is more than 75 or patient is young but unfit for intensive chemo survey. It is a randomized two to one arm. One arm received venetoclax 400 milligram daily for 28 days plus as a 75 milligram per square meter for seven days versus the other arm placebo of, and as a 75 milligram. If look for the composite uh, CR rate in all groups, it was higher in the combination than plus ESA as placebo ESA. For all patients, composite CR rate is 66.4% versus 28.3 in the placebo ESA. For patients having IDH1 or 2 mutation, it was much more higher, 75.4% in the Ben ASA versus 10.7% in ASA alone. If you look for the flat 3 harboring patient, it was 72.4% compared to 36.4. And patient having NBM mutation, it is 66.7 versus 23.4, and even in TB53. And this composite rate before the initiation of the second cycle, it was for all patients 43%. It is markedly increased in the CR rate in patients receiving the combination then plus ASA. The overall survival also has been improved to a median of 14.7 months then ASA versus 9.6 months in the placebo ASA. Uh, older hematologists like me, if you talk about uh, elderly ML patient more than 75 years and you can achieve median overall survival 14.7 months, 20 years ago, uh, it was for us non-believable. Nowadays, it is possible. What more? If you look to the one of the two uh, important groups, the IDH1 and 2 mutated subgroup and the FLT3 mutated group. If you look for the overall survival in Ben as arm, it is having a median of 24.5 months compared to 6.2 months in the placebo as arm, which is four times higher. If we look to the composite CR rate, then as a, it has 78.5% compared to 10.7%. This is one of the good results that no one could believe it. Even patient harboring flat 3 whether internal tantal or uh, terminal kinase domain mutation, okay, the wind as I have a median of 13.3 months uh, overall survival compared to 8.6 months. And also the composite CR rate, it is 70% compared to 36 in the placebo ASA. All in favor of the combination of bin plus ASA. From which we came to the Viali C, which is a phase three double blind study combining bin plus LEDAC versus placebo LEDAC. Why LEDAC? Because LEDAC was the backbone of treatment of elderly unfit ML patients. Key inclusion criteria also patient more than 75 years or more than 18 years with comorbidity. Primary endpoint overall survival. Here the randomization is two to one. Here they started venetoclax with 600 milligram plus LDAC 20 milligram per square meter for day one to day eight versus placebo and LDAC 20 milligram. If we look, they started in the ben as a venetoclax 400. Here they shoot to 600 milligram. Despite that the primary entry point has been not met, but there is market improvement with the combination Ben LEDAC versus LEDAC alone. If we look for the 12 months median overall survival, it was 7.2 in Ben LEDAC compared to 4.1 months. After six months of additional therapy, Ben LEDAC median overall survival become 8.4 months, and for placebo LEDAC, it is still 4.1 months. If we look for these two, Kaplan Meyer, both behave the same in the first three to six months, but after six months, they show advantage. 
because early that may lose the effectiveness after certain times of therapy. But what our concern? Our concern is the safety because we are talking about patients with comorbidity or patient elderly than 75. If we look to the VIN as a site of combination or venetoclax early that combination, hematological side effects seen more than or equivalent to grade three adverse effect with thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, with a febrile neutropenia, anemia, leukopenia, non-hematologic like pneumonia, diarrhea, et cetera. But what is important is 30 day mortality. It is seen in 21 patients of Ben Aza, which makes 7% of the patient. Placebo Aza, it is nine patients and 6%. There is no big differences in the 30 day mortality. This continuation of therapy due to adverse effects has been seen in 24% in Ben Aza compared to 4% in the placebo Aza. What about venetoclax Elidac? 30 day mortality is seen in 13% Ben Elidac compared to 16% in placebo Elidac. Therefore, placebo Elidac have higher rates of mortality. This continuation of ad due to adverse effect, 25% versus 24%. It looks that it is a manageable uh, toxicity that we are talking about if we are looking for the advantage by prolonging the overall survival and prolonging the remission rate. Here comes an emerging real-world evidence supporting all this clinical trial. It is a multi-center trial comparing more than 102 treated patients with ven aza ven d elidac versus high or low-intensity chemotherapy. Median age was 73 years old, adverse cytogenetic in 60 uh, in 64.7. If we look to the composite CR rate, it was 68% in the vein containing regimen versus 40% in the control. If we look to the treatment cost discontinuation due to uh, adverse effect, it was 61% in the vein containing regimen compared to 80% in the control. And the control means low or intensive chemotherapy. The median overall survival in vein containing regimen reach 24 months, whereas in the control, it is about 8.7 months. There is three times higher median overall survival if we compare with Ben Aza compared to low or high intensive chemotherapy, which in favor of this in the future. Okay, therefore, according to the updates, if the patient with newly diagnosed AML ineligible for intensive chemotherapy, first priority will be Aza venetoclax. Second priority, either hypomycelating agent alone, Elidac venetoclax, Elidac plus elastigib. Third priority will be Elidac. This depends on the physician choice, and you have to decide it. I think Elidac will be given only for very old, frail patients. As a summary, more treatment options now available for patients ineligible for intensive chemotherapy with the addition of IVOS or uh, enazitinib as IDH1 or 2 inhibitor and gelatinib as GLAT3 inhibitor. Uh, combination with venetoclax or uh, gelatinib give, give efficacy across all genetic subgroup. Availability of oral agent like oral ASA will increase the treatment and increase the quality and quality of life. Giving as a standard combination with the backbone elidac or hypomycelating agent to increase the efficacy. Practical consideration is a molecular screening or comprehensive study. Here is a question for uh, all uh, attendees. If you have a patient more than 75 years old, you, will you go for molecular study like FLIT3 uh, mutation or uh, IDH1 or 2? Because the patient uh, harboring uh, AML and aged more than 75, I think he will be ineligible for uh, combination therapy and maybe use, using one of the novel target therapy. Future, novel agent combination and immunotherapy, maintenance therapy, and MRD driven de escalation strategy. And thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, Tarek. Uh, uh, I think we can have some question uh, before we proceed to the uh, uh, next session. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Tarek, about uh, uh, the cost uh, impact uh, of uh, those new medication. Uh, yes, the cost is one of the obstacles we are facing, but uh, I think nowadays the insurance can uh, 
uh, is approving. If you look for the combination as a plus uh, Veneto clax, they are approving that. Okay, no problem. But uh, it depends on which kind of insurance class the patient is. And also the flat three also, are you? The flat three, the flat three is, uh, uh, generally speaking, is too, too expensive. I, anyway, I know that uh, the Midostorin, I think one tablet is 2,000 real. Yeah. The other one, the um, Glitternib is- uh, Glitternib is almost, almost uh, is monthly cost 90,000 real. So insurance company uh, approve also uh, I think they cannot cover it because uh, they have a budget limit of uh, 500,000 real per year. If we say it was glitteritinib, the patient uh, has to be maintained uh, until disease progression, uh, it will only uh, enough for five to six months. After that, uh, he, his insurance will vanish. Thank you. Uh, so please write your uh, question and answer in the Q&A uh, part. And uh, there is a, a question come to me for Dr. Ziad Shibani uh, about the IDH-induced uh, 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 toxicity. It's like the uh, uh, differentiation syndrome. Uh, so what's your uh, management for those uh, yeah, any side effects of this medication, uh, Dr. Ziad? Yeah. Uh... It was not mentioned in the in the poster itself, but it's managed clinically. They don't decrease the dose. They give a steroid, and uh, they keep uh, watching. But they, they were treating it mainly, more or less, like uh, atra differentiation syndrome. So, thank you very much. So now we'll proceed with the uh, um, uh, last but not least uh, uh, part of our uh, webinar today. Uh, Dr. Mohammed uh, Al Makadi will speak about uh, myelodysplastic syndrome. Dr. Al Makadi uh, currently is a consultant uh, hematology consultant in uh, uh, King Faisal Specialist Hospital Research Center in Medina. Uh, Dr. McCaddy uh, did his uh, fellowship in uh, uh, McMaster uh, Hamilton uh, University, and also he worked there as uh, a staff um, uh, in, in, the, uh, in Hamilton. Um, he underwent, he finished uh, uh, general hematology, then malignant and allogenic stem cell transplant fellowships there. Um, he did the PhD and uh, he co-authored uh, many high impact uh, journal uh, during his uh, stay study there. We are honored to have you, Dr. Mohammed, uh, and uh, please uh, proceed. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I would like to thank the organizing committee. Thank you, Chairman, uh, for the opportunity to present tonight. Um, so. Today, I'll be talking about myelodysplastic syndrome. I have no conflict of uh, interest to disclose. So a little bit of a background. So myelodysplastic syndromes are clonal hematopoietic disorders. They're characterized by ineffective hematopoiesis, which leads to uh, different cytotenias. It's a multi-step process that involves molecular changes uh, changes to the bone marrow microenvironment and uh, epigenetic uh, modulation. Uh, the usual median age of diagnosis is around 70 years. Um, and the prognosis is not great for patients at higher risk, ranging between median overall survival or three year overall, overall survival of around uh, closer to a year to up to three years. So it's a matter of balancing quality of life and overall survival benefits according to the MDS stage or risk. The higher the risk, the more uh, the uh, approaches toward curing the disease or treating the disease. The lower the risk, the focus will be on consequences of cytopenias and quality of life. Um, so I will be presenting around 12 uh, abstracts. Um, at the beginning, we'll, we'll be talking about uh, some interesting abstracts that, abstract that talked about disease biology. Uh, starting with, for example, this study that talks about cohesin. So what is cohesin? It's a complex protein um, 
that actually facilitates the sister chrom um, chromatid cohesion and then ultimately segregation during mitosis and meiosis. So if it is mutated, the cohesion ring formation will be disrupted and this ultimately will affect cell cellular differentiation and self-renewal. So what this group has done, they um, uh, did uh, sequencing on around 420 MDS patients, um, expected median age, 60% uh, of them were around male. A majority of them were um, uh, MDS with or without ring sideroblast. Um, and then uh, majority of them were also according to, to the rev uh, revised IPSS were very low and low risk. Um, around 85% had normal karyotype um, and uh, uh, mutational changes in keeping with very good uh, or good risk. Uh, so after a median follow-up of around 2.3 years, um, uh, around 50% 50, 50 of those patients, they actually died and 30% of them progressed to AML. So they found around, um, uh, so our, what they sequenced for was 54 mutation in around 50 patients. So they found these mutations in 50 patients. So what they actually found is the presence of the, mu of the mutation will lead to shorter overall survival. Yes, they actually happen in patients with uh, excess blast or intermediate risk, but if this actually occurred in patients with very low uh, or like lower risk MDS, it actually leads to significant uh, worse outcome with a hazard ratio of around 2.3. Um, so basically what you're looking at here, the presence of the mutation uh, led to more transformation into AML and the presence of the mutation, yes, these two groups are separated as very low risk and intermediate, but once the mutation is, is present in the very low risk patient, they actually become, um, uh, they actually will have identical overall survival to intermediate risk and risk of transformation. So very interesting finding that will actually inform us uh, at this uh, or for those lower risk population. The next study looked at how would you uh, check for iron overload in uh, MDS patients. So it's a Canadian study. Uh, they enrolled patients between January 2008 to, uh, to June 2019. So what they tried to test for is the, um, the utility of using uh, transferrin saturation especially when we know that ferritin can sometimes be hard to interpret. Uh, it's an acute phase reactant. There are other causes for elevated ferritin. So it's a good number of patients, around 720 with the expected median age. Majority of them were low and intermediate risk uh, population. Um, expected median transfusion uh, density. So what they actually have found is um, higher transferrin saturation uh, in like parallel or, or in comparison to the ferritin can also predict for worse uh, overall survival uh, and also PF, uh, uh, progression free survival and leukemic free uh, survival, um, especially uh, when they categorize patients according to uh, the ferritin value. So for those who had ferritin more than 1000, they subcategorize those into three uh, groups. And I'll show this in the next slide. So they found higher ferritin along with uh, uh, transferrin saturation more than 80% can actually be a prediction for worse overall survival, especially uh, to predict cardiac death related uh, uh, or cardiac death free survival with a significant p-value. Um, this actually has been a very hot topic lately in cancer. So measuring for inflammasome, um, for example, uh, uh, the NOD, LRP3 inflammasome is a, no, a protein complex. It actually uh, locates in, in the um, cytoplasm. So um, these inflammasomes are different than um, bacterial driven. So we call those sterile um, inflammatory uh, or inflammasome. So in a sterile in, inflammatory state, they, if they become activated, they will actually activate and help the release of IL-1 beta and IL-18. IL and what the researchers have, researchers have found in MDS, it's a smoldering pro-inflammatory state um, uh, that, that happens in the, in, the, in the niche or in the micro environment, which will lead to activation of this inflammasome. And what happens is 
ultimately this will lead to a specific or a un unique way of cell death. It's called pyroptosis, which are lysis based. It's different than uh, apoptosis. So um, what they have done in this study, they actually uh, analyzed um, uh, around 100 bone marrow samples. Uh, and I, hi I highlighted the lower risk because this is where uh, the, the proportion was higher. So they did PCR for the 12 genes encoding for inflammasome related proteins. And they also measured in the blood uh, the inflammatory me uh, mediators level. So what they actually have found, as I said earlier in the, in the prior uh, slide, that the gene expression was higher in lower risk MDS. And then when they did a uh, principal component analysis, they were able to subdivide this lower risk MDS uh, uh, patients into three cohorts according to the um, value or the extent of gene expression level. So if it's low, they called it one. If it's high, they called it two. And if it's medium, they called it three. And you know everybody is excited uh, in terms of the expertise in this area. They actually took this into now the next level. They want to do uh, what they call it now the can fire trial. So they are investigating the role of IL-1 one one beta antibody, um, canacunumab. Uh, so we'll see what this trial will show. And just to uh, attach an image to what I explained to you. So each dot represents bone marrow samples. So in comparison to non-chip, if the expression is lower, uh, these um, um, dots represent um, uh, mutations that could encode for SF3B1, which we see in ring pseudoblast population. Uh, so this was the most prominent in this uh, cohort. And the higher the expression was actually more prominent in for example, deletion 5Q. Again, this can give, a, give them a uh, kind of a expectation of what the mutation could be and then whether this can be targeted or not. Again, staying within the area of uh, lower risk population, um, do, we have a, do we have other options than just blood product transfusion? Can we use, for example, TPO receptor agonists? We all know that anemia is much more common, but still thrombocytopenia can happen for uh, up to 15% of those patients. And they have done, and they have shown in clinical trials that using TPO receptor agonists uh, can actually lead to up to 50% platelet response uh, in certain um, lower risk MDS population. So this uh, study, they, they co collectively uh, examined the role of l thrombobag in MDS and CML, C CML uh, population. Uh, again, they had to be lower risk, no excess blast. The so the bone marrow was less than 5%. And it was started, um, or the requirement for the start for the initiation is a platelet count uh, less than or equal 50. So there was a response, uh, maybe up to 70 percent, more in the NDS in the NDS population versus CMML, with a duration closer to a, a year. Some of them were actually um, still responding even after this continuation. But you really need to be careful about thrombotic events. So. Uh, most of these patients who had thrombotic events had actually prior history of arterial or venous thrombosis. Uh, nothing concerning about progression into AML. Is it an option? Maybe it is an option, but it has to be done in a selected population. Uh, and then all the, the, also the excitement about the spiral set. Again, uh, we, we moved from platelet transfusion. Now we're talking about um, alternatives for red blood cell transfusion. So a little bit of a background. So Losparacet is a recombinant fusion protein uh, that actually decreases SMAT2 and SMAT3. Uh, so what happens it actually binds to a, to a select type of transforming uh, growth factor. Uh, and, then, and then what happened is this will ultimately help erythroid maturation because there is a state of eryth erythroid maturation at risk. Um, these trials commonly use what the Inter International Working Group 2006 uh, defined, which is called the hematologic improvement erythroid. So basically defining, uh, so dividing patients between higher or lower risk uh, transfusion burden. So if they're requiring less than four units uh, per eight weeks, you, you need to look for at least 15 gram improvement in, in hemoglobin. If they are needing four and above, they have to have 50% reduction in um, uh, transfusion requirement uh, uh, over eight weeks. This is what the definition. So again, little bit of background, phase two study, in a lower risk MDS, they actually uh, published this in Lancet uh, Oncology. They showed around 65% uh, of erythroid response and even around 40% of transfusion independent for at least eight weeks. And then 
the Middleist trial, which is actually uh, just been published in New England. Uh, it's a phase three RCT, um, a placebo control. They compared um, in uh, uh, lower risk MDS. And this was done in bring blood. Why? Because in, in the phase two study, the majority of the effect was, was in the lower risk MDS with ring sideroblast. So they continued studying the same patient population. And again, they have shown transfusion independence for at least eight weeks, um, 30, around 40% versus 13%. Most common side effect is fatigue, lack of energy, and nausea. So um, what happened in the Middle East trial for those people who has not shown any response by week 25 is what this study about. So what they have done is they analyzed those patients uh, further. So what they did is they continued those patients on the same therapy. And if you want to know the dose of uh, losparacid, it starts with one milligram per kg, and you go up to 1.75 every three weeks. They actually, it was an interesting um, uh, result because they showed continuing beyond 24 weeks, there are actually response. So uh, around 16% uh, uh, of patients, they became transfusion independent. And overall, for the whole duration, 47% of patients, they achieved uh, hematologic improvement erythroid. Exciting results. Um, and then this actually took um, the whole uh, 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 researchers to uh, start or to uh, continue forward into the COMMANDS trial. What they published in the EHA uh, is just a protocol of the study. So this is open now, it's a phase three. They want now to include whether the patient had uh, patients have ring pseudoblast or not. And now they're comparing losparacid to uh, erythropoietin alpha, uh, looking at similar uh, primary and secondary endpoints. And then I'm really excited about this drug. So uh, um, a metal stat is used in primary myofibrosis early on, and now it's making its way to MDS. So we all know that um, for the healthy of uh, cell proliferation, um, the telomere are very important to be maintained uh, for the integrity of the DNA. Um, and then we need for that reason, a healthy telomerase. So if the cells are rapidly proliferating, you would think that telomerase is highly active. So if you use a telomerase inhibitor, then you will, do, you will induce selective apoptosis of these highly proliferating cells. So it makes sense for this to, to start in myeloproliferative neoplasm, hence the name, but now it made, it, it made its way to MDS. And again, uh, they were looking at patients who cannot receive any therapy. So that's why they, they excluded deletion 5Q. And uh, they tested this on patients who are refractory to EPO-stimulating agent. Um, they actually showed, again, transfusion independent, good percentage, around 40%. Um, and then they, this, was, this was actually published or presented in EHA 2020. So in, in 2022, they took us into uh, the uh, adverse uh, effects of this drug. Nothing significant, nothing major. Most commonly is thrombocytopenia. Um, the duration was not that prolonged. And then uh, they, they may actually end up do, doing dose reduction. In the meantime, through the first dose reduction was around 11 weeks. Um, the percentage of cytopenia that needing, needing treatment discontinuation was very small, only 20%. But it's important to also mention the ones that actually cause hemorrhagic or fibrinotropenia. Again, they were not increased, they were only less than 10%. Uh, one unique thing is AST-related uh, uh, increase without causing liver injury. It will only happen in one person. So nothing striking about safety of this trial, of this drug. So we'll see what the trial will, uh, what the trial will show, because now there is a phase three trial comparing uh, amelostat to placebo, and it's ongoing. So moving now into higher risk population, uh, this was just presenting real, wo real uh, world data. Uh, why would uh, physicians stop uh, hypomethylating agents? The goal is you want to get the patients to at least receive four cycles and above. So they use less than four cycle as a, a definition of um, a treatment interruption, or if you had to give, uh, if you had to interrupt therapy for at least 90 days. And it's been shown that this actually is linked with world survival because of what can be given at, for those patients population at that time. Now we have other options. So it's a, it's a retrospective study. They looked into around uh, 664 uh, patients um, treated with uh, hypomethylating agents. And um, uh, around 
which is still a big number. 30% uh, of them discontinued therapy. Majority was after cycle one, whether because this is readily available in the state or uh, because of other factors. We cannot know that's one of the uh, pitfall of uh, retrospective study. Again, uh, the, the message is the most determining factor for discontinuing hypomethylating agent is higher age and poor performance status. So all the excitement in AML, now it's made its way to uh, MDS with venetoprax. As we know, it, uh, uh, it blocks the anti-apophotic effect of BCL2. Um, so it has received the FDA uh, uh, approval for um, um, non-low risk MDS or higher risk MDS. Um, so what they have done in this uh, study, they just went to analyze the safety of the combination. Um, so majority of the complications were mitropenia and thrombocytopenia. Um, there was um, no, no significant increase in the incidence of these complications. Uh, excellent overall response rate, 40%, they would achieve PR. Um, and the median overall survival for such a small study was around 28 uh, months. 23% of patients were actually able to move on to stem cell transplantation. Um, this is pretty much showing the same result. It was just a systematic review of what has been published about the combination, similar response rate, similar toxicity. So it's consistent among uh, uh, all studies. And now what we are waiting for is the phase three study, Verona uh, trial that will actually enroll uh, 500 uh, patients. Uh, they published just the protocol of uh, the study. They, we don't have results yet. So we're all excited to see what will that show. Um, and then um, they have covered uh, the role of IDH2 inhibitors in AML um, in acidinib. So we know how uh, IDH2 uh, function uh, and in acidinib is pretty much an oral inhibitor for IDH2 uh, enzyme. So here, this is a very cleverly designed um, a study. So they wanted to test uh, uh, giving uh, in, in, uh, in acidinib in two patient population. Either they are uh, uh, HMA naive or they actually uh, have received HMA in the past. So two groups, one will, will receive in acidinib alone and one will receive in acidinib with um, azacitidine. So around 48 patients, uh, pretty much um, half and a half into each group, uh, expected median age. Um, the addition did not affect the median um, cycle of therapy for azacitidine, so it was around four. Uh, expected when it was given alone to receive to have slightly um, uh, higher median number of treatments, no striking toxicities uh, for the combination, uh, whether it's uh, grade three or four cytopenias or infection. Um, again, this was covered in the previous uh, uh, presentations. Uh, the occurrence of IDH differentiation syndrome. Um, expected to happen more in the uh, ANA alone uh, because you would think that uh, azacitidine would maybe help in cytoreduction, maybe less differentiation. Again, small number to make a strong uh, conclusion, but interesting uh, uh, effect for such a therapy in, in this population opens the option uh, for uh, patients with, with, with uh, this mutation. Um, so, um, and then moving into more definitive therapy, this is uh, a poster or a study that was um, uh, presented. Um, so there were two groups in this study, King Faisal Specialist Hospital and King's College. Um, the, the message I want to give you from this um, study is, um, although most of the patients were AML, 16 uh, patients were MDS, is just to show that, um, um, that with the two different protocols, aiming at either T cell replete or uh, T cell deplete, what will be the ultimate outcome? Um, this, these protocols are standard. Uh, we don't need to go over the details of them. They, um, so both uh, centers, they gave similar GBHD prophylaxis. Um, both centers had um, uh, similar um, outcomes in terms of acute events, uh, excellent chimerism uh, at both centers. And then the overall incident of acute GBHD was similar. Using, using the two uh, approaches, whether T cell replete or T cell deplete. But the take home message is the chronic GVHD was significantly higher. Um, and um, using, the, for example, King Faisal uh, uh, regimen that, that they used for this study, 
which was aiming at um, um, depleting T cells. And, and it's, it's, it's a very hard um, uh, decision scientifically because you are worried about chronic GVHD or you're actually worried about uh, grass failure. So that's, that's, that's the balance between the two regimens. Did not affect overall um, survival or relapse between the two groups, but it only led to slightly more chronic GVHD if you deplete um, um, uh, uh, if you deplete T cells and more CMV reactivation. Uh, uh, so this was the main difference between the two groups. And um, th this is just to show you in figure or uh, Kaplan-Meier format, no changes in overall survival, just slightly more uh, chronic GBHD if you use ATG or T cell replete um, uh, strategies. Uh, ending with, uh, with the disease, we, we all uh, are desperate for more uh, 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 like uh, um, outcome changing measures is um, CMML. So this was a very big registry study. Uh, it's not to compare between the two diseases. We know that CMML is different than MDS, but it's just to show that even, even when you actually uh, have similar uh, performance status between the two groups, the CMML group and then MDS group, similar uh, type of donors, similar uh, uh, induction uh, regimen or conditioning regimen, uh, they actually continue to even, even after transplant, CML continue to have worse overall survival uh, in comparison to, uh, uh, to MDS. Um, I know it's not showing, um, uh, but this is the, this was, these, these were the figures attached to the uh, abstract, but the red line represents the CML and you can see the median overall survival is much worse and the relapse survival is much worse. No difference in non-transplant related mortality, but um, one thing to consider that may have affected the outcome in this group is the fact they actually used slightly uh, uh, more uh, uh, reduced intensity regimen. Um, food for thought, um, we really uh, have heterogeneous approach at CMML when we reach that stage. Uh, sometimes they, they, they act like uh, uh, AML on fire, and those will be an easier in, uh, in terms of what to choose for them. But sometimes they, they continue to act in indolence, maybe just an opening uh, uh, results for us to think about this group of patients differently and look uh, forward toward much more novel approach uh, in, in CMML uh, population, because they're pretty much now becoming their own niche and their own uh, uh, being, I would say. Uh, so this was uh, my last slide. Thank you very much for listening. But yeah, uh, so I must thank you, Dr. Uh, Makadi. Uh, suddenly, I lost the uh, the Zoom. Uh, uh, sorry for that. Uh, thank you for your uh, really nice uh, presentation. MDS, we are desperate more. I mean, like C CMML, and now um, a lot of studies. And uh, there is, you know, the first FDA approved medication for this uh, disease. Uh, I like um, that uh, many are um, studying this uh, rare disease. Um, I want to, uh, before we go to question, to thank all our attendants. Uh, we reach 1,000, more than 1,000 uh, uh, participants uh, in this webinar, and uh, I hope uh, um, they will be, they benefit from uh, this. Uh, so, um, to, uh, Mr. Fuad, can you please you project uh, the next uh, webinar, and we will take questions. Uh, uh, now, there is a question uh, for uh, Dr. Tariq first about the FLT3 in, um, inhibitors. In your opinion, any superiority of one of them and overall survivor, Dr. Tarek? Uh, maybe Dr. Tarek is there. Yes, 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 Dr. Marawan. Uh, I think in the FLT3 inhibitor, uh, uh, we are looking, uh, we have no uh, large experience about the overall survivor because they are recently. Uh, used since more than uh, not more than uh, two years, okay, in order to put in comparison. 
but I think that the Gilead Retin will have a advantage over the traditional FLT3 inhibitor. But uh, I have a question in, in the opposite, okay? Should we go for molecular and cytogenetic study for patient uh, un uh, uneligible or ineligible for intensive chemotherapy, or should we go immediately for a combination uh, hypomycelating agent with venetoclax? Uh, because all the data said that uh, this combination are affecting all uh, the mutation, whether the patient is FLT3 positive, uh, or the patient is IDH1 or 2, or the patient is giving NMBBN. This question for all, uh, uh, I think it's um, maybe for Dr. Ziad, he can <laughs> reply on that. Yeah, depending on the practice. Yes, uh, Ziad, what's your practice? Usually you wait for... Uh... Um, molecular or uh, NGS FLT3, or you just start the venetoclax ASA? To be honest, um, the ideal situation usually when they ask uh, the same questions to a colleague from uh, MD Anderson in Chicago, and the question was like, if I put it in the other way, what is uh, clinically important in mutation you want to get? Uh, before you start. So their answer was, I want to do bone marrow uh, and I get the result uh, same day for the flow. And uh, at least I'd like to rule out uh, 15, 17 deletion. Uh, so I'm not dealing with APL. And then I'd like to get the core binding factor, FLT3, IDH1 and 2 and MPM1 uh, and uh, C, uh, CPIP alpha, uh, ASXL1, uh, TB53, DNMT3A, and this is like a baseline. Uh, and then I can wait for the spices uh, mutation, which is the, and MD Anderson will take 10 days to get 81 gene panel. In our practice, and this is uh, when I, in my talk, I did mention about uh, the paper from Germany, uh, it is safe to wait how long. And in that paper, uh, they compare the outcome, the overall uh, survival and CR, CRI uh, in patient uh, cohort, uh, less than 60 years, more than 60 years. And at the end, there was uh, no uh, difference in the outcome if you wait uh, between uh, 10 to 15 days before you start your chemotherapy. Of course, if your patient's stable, no chest infection, no high white blood cells count, though you can give hydroxyurea if it's in AML and, and wait. Um, so. To answer question for Dr. Tarek, I think I will wait before just uh, jump and start uh, hypomethylating agent, unless if the patient, you know, for yeah. sure he is he's unfit because of the performance status, not because of his disease condition. Um, I will go for uh, venetoclax and ASITD. And you know, all our cases, it, it, it's being discussed in multidisciplinary meetings. Yeah. Yes, I was uh, talking because we have a junior attendees here because it is quite different between uh, in, uh, patient in uh, eligible or ineligible for intensive chemotherapy. If the patient is eligible for intensive chemotherapy, as you know, we're going to do the molecular and cytogenetic and we will not wait for the result because we're going to start with 3 plus 7, okay, and the result can okay uh, uh, after a couple of days because it will de uh, decide when we will go for transplantation. But uh, the crucial uh, is patient ineligible for transplantation. I definitely totally ag agree with you. If the patient is uh, uh, can wait, we will wait, okay? There is no uh, problem if we wait for a couple of days, unless the patient is having uh, severe comorbidity and he in need of uh, starting the medication immediately. Agree, agree, Dr. Tariq. Usually, and we wait uh, only to rule out APL initially, then yeah, definitely. according definitely. to the performance. And, uh, and later when, um, you know, uh, core binding factor comes, we start late, the myelotark, and this is the problem. Sometimes we start at day eight, day nine, depend on the results, uh, when it will come. Usually seven days yeah, and in our center, not bad, alhamdulillah. Um, a question to uh, Dr. Al Makadi about the MDS. So there was a question that, what do you think the cause of the iron overload mainly in those patients? It's really the hepcidin-related uh, inflammation um, or 
this is uh, there is another uh, reason for uh, mild dysplastic uh, syndrome patient to have uh, iron overload. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a combination of uh, multi multiple uh, reasons. So the disease it, itself with the ineffective erythropoiesis will lead to, uh, uh, to this acute inflammatory state. I wouldn't, call, uh, I wouldn't think of it as a cause. It, it, it would just be a bystander, but you're absolutely right. Theoretically, upregulating hepcidin will, will, will lead into this. And then last but not the least is what we do to those patients. We, the transfusion support. That's, this is why uh, people are desperate to find ways to uh, decrease the frequency uh, of, of transfusion or, or to decrease the transfusion burden. Um, thank you very much. Um, if there is uh, no, um, let me check the questions. Okay, no, it's always about the certificate. Uh, so for certificate, uh, there is in the chat, uh, there is answer by the Saudi Society of Blood uh, Disorder. Um, thank you for uh, these really attend the participant and uh, all the organizers. Thank, uh, thanks for uh, our uh, outstanding speaker uh, for uh, uh, this session. I enjoy it and um, um, it was very uh, helpful uh, for uh, our colleagues. Um, the Saudi Society of Blood Disorder have the fourth webinar uh, coming uh, next uh, Friday, which will be the last in those uh, series. Uh, they will talk about the cellular and the immunotherapy, particularly the CAR T cell, which we like that we have it in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, we enrolled patient and uh, those uh, outstanding speaker uh, will speak about uh, the uh, maybe the also some of the local uh, um, experience uh, and uh, the toxicity. CAR T cell is uh, uh, future for many disease, uh, myeloma, lymphoma. And please uh, uh, yeah, uh, join us uh, on this uh, webinar next Friday, same time. And uh, also you can uh, see uh, all our activity webinar and through our channels and YouTube, Twitter, and uh, um, everything uh, Everything will be in the poster, uh, uh, all the detail. I mean, it will be in our website and the uh, uh, poster. I want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Amal Bihani also about uh, um, her organizing all this uh, agenda, putting this uh, our speakers together and invite us to to this uh, to tonight uh, event. Um, have a nice um, uh, night, uh, everyone, and thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. Famanallah. Salaamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Famanallah. Ma'asalam. Ma'asalam.